Well, after this moment of anxiety, <laughs> let me <laughs> begin by thanking uh, Christina Miranda, who helped me out of this, but also to organize, along with Benjamin, this wonderful conference, and I'm very happy to have been invited to come and talk about this issue. Um, before I say anything else, I have had three or four comments saying, what has the investigative journalism got to do with the sharing society? Um, it's a good question. Uh, I mulled about the title and, in fact, the work I was going to present here for a while, trying to figure out whether we're dealing with sharing society as a wishful thinking about society starting to share, or dealing with sharing societies, which is with the various kinds of group of people who are interested in sharing. And I thought, well, I would like to see a particularly interesting case of sharing, which is sharing among rivals. Because you can't be more protective about your information than if you're a journalist. And you really want to, you know, hold on to their own scoop. And so the idea that investigative journalism would begin to share their data was already a big challenge. But I had another reason. Every year since 1997, the McLuhan program has greeted a Filipino uh, investigative journalist, or jo uh, lady or man, in this case we have the last uh, 17 and 18 guests. The uh, Canadian Embassy in Manila has organized with the help of the McLuhan program to give this prize and allow these people to come to Canada, spend some time there finding other journalists, uh, and, uh, and, ha and, and, and becoming fellows of the McLuhan program and, and giving a lecture, several lectures at the program. And so that was one of the reasons the interest that we've had in investigative journalism goes back a fair bit. Uh, and we were particularly interested in the development of uh, journalism investigation and new media. And since we started in 1997, already it was very interesting, for example, our first winner, uh, got the prize for having gotten the information and the communication of Filipinos outside the country, because under Marcos in that time, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't say much. So, and also because most of the Filipinos who had left Philippines for working outside and so on actually were online, while only 50,000 Filipinos were online at the time. So it was interesting to see that the role of new media was a very powerful to actually motivate investigative journalism. Of course, the second reason was my work on connected intelligence, which is uh, come here on the map that I found per chance, and I have no idea who made it, but interesting that they highlighted the, our, my, my uh, sources, Thorsten Veblen and the Staples Theory, and of course, Harold Innes, who was the big influence on McLuhan, and I was the director of the McLuhan program. And so, uh, and, and so I sort of connected with, with all these all this thinking. But I want to start with something you've all read. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, and it was the winter of despair. Well, I can tell you, in those days when I was running the McLuhan program from 1983 to 2008, it was the best of times. We were so hopeful. We thought that, you know, all of these new media. Plus, I was a researcher in, just following McLuhan, in the impact of technology on culture, but deep down, particularly on psychology. My first ground was the alphabet. The alphabet is the, is the way by which each one of us has appropriated language, internalized it, and turned it into thought. No? The alphabet allows you to silence language and turn it into a thinking process. Not that people who didn't read or write didn't think, of course not. But to be able to articulate one's thinking to the extent that the phonetic alphabet did was a fantastic achievement. So why do I talk about the alphabet? Because of course what was coming up was not a few letters that allowed us to articulate reality. It was zero one that was bringing absolutely everything as a fulcrum for all sensory modes, for all thinking, for all expressions. And so the idea of exploring the impact and the consequences of the gradual arrival of uh, this new, 
new ground medium was, of course, the central interest of the McLuhan program. So that's why I think, why do I quote this? Is because now is the worst of time. Now we are all realizing, oh, well, it's not so good after all. We saw that, you know, there was a panacea. I don't think McLuhan thought that way. Marshall was very keen on that. He said, no, no, no. Privacy is over. He said it before Zuckerberg. Uh, individuality, all of that is going to be washed away like a, like a tidal wave. Because electricity does not like privacy. That was a very powerful statement. So yes, it's the worst of time. Look at this horrible thing. Worst charities. This is the list of all the charities and who made them and where did it go. So we've got the first one is Kids Wish Network. Total raised by solicitors, 127 million. Paid to solicitors, 109 million. Spent on direct cash for the children, 2.5%. That's absolutely scandalous. Uh, cancer Funds of America. God knows all of you have been solicited for Cancer Fund. 98 million, 80 million to solicitors, 0.9% went to the actual research. We sort of knew this. We always, you know, we ask you money and you sort of think, oh, well, where is it really going, right? Then we have another thing coming. Post-truth, alternate facts. For those who have done symbiotics, I find very useful to say that we are losing the referent. You know what the symbiotics say? The trial of the sign. Signified, signifier, signified, okay? Signifier is whatever word or object you see. Signified is a thought that you have in mind, seeing this word or seeing this object. But what's guaranteeing the relationship between signifier and signified is that there is a referent, which means that in reality, somewhere in some fashion, whatever you're talking about is real. Even if it's, if it, even it's a fiction, that fiction exists as a, as a concept that is real. It's gone. It's gone. You don't need today, if you are a reader of Trump's tweets, to actually have a referent at all. People just don't care. So it's a very serious thing. And so what's happening is, and this is where the study of the alphabet and the study of the internet is very useful. In the time of the alphabet, what happens? We have a separation between self and world. We have a constant relationship of verification between self and world. In this time, with these <laughs> new technologies, there is no need for this verification. We have now something that is a conflation of objectivity and subjectivity. Whereas before, the gradual separation of objective and subjective took a fair bit. And it took a time, and then eventually you had a scientific process that came in and gave you reference. But this, the disappearance of reference is a serious problem. And I don't know how epistemologically we will get out of this mess. Maybe we'll find some other way. But for the moment, objective and subjective are in peril, uh, uh, together are in, in peril. Then we have, we're, we're back in the era of the absurd. I don't know how many people have felt, among, how many among you have felt this, wait a minute. This is completely ridiculous. What kind of characters are we dealing with? And I'm not just talking about you know, the president administration of the United States. How about this guy who actually threw them in the Iraq war and is trying to push them into the Iran war at this point for absolutely no other reason than fooling around with the public? Then the other question is this one. We all talk about democracy, right? And we believe in democracy. We still live in democracy, just as we still live with a self inside out that is our negotiator with reality. But that's on the way out too. Democracy is not electrical. It doesn't work with electricity. It doesn't work with new, new media. It doesn't work with, with uh, uh, digitization. Democracy is an invention by the Greeks at the time of the alphabet. It was at the time when people could represent, not everybody in Athens, but at least the people who had somehow they could represent themselves in the boule, the decision making. That was a true democracy. Then we, we felt it was great, and it is great. But we illusion ourselves to think that we are going towards more democracy. We're not. We're going to something totally different, to which I will address myself a little bit later. But clearly, these people are not interested in democracy, are not practicing it, and are not giving the example of, you know, the rule of law. The rule of law is really what's really in, in peril. 
It's one thing to have democracy as a concept and an ideology. It's another to live in a state that respects either a constitution or the legal process. And when you don't respect the legal process for a long time, you just ruin the whole thing. Then we have this one too, you know, serious climate change in the UK, I mean this in two levels, um, hence the picture. But the climate change is a very serious, pro a very serious uh, concern right now. It doesn't just take Greta Thunberg to, to tell us this thing. It's a something that's really happening and we have to consider it as something that we have to deal with. Then we all know about corporate inside jobs and we've all heard about, obviously, uh, the Panama Papers. Now, why do we hear about all these things? Yes, there is investigative journalism, but there is also this. The rise of transparency. If there is no privacy, well, the upside of it is that everything comes up, wells up, transparency wells up from the bottom up. And so we have, this is a, a, a map of one year of all the revelation, the, the revelation in red, uh, Google's problems in blue, uh, face recognition, which is being more and more introduced in the United States in green. Anyway, you, this will be available. You'll be able to see more of it. But we all heard about Panama Papers, <coughs> Paradise Papers, Me Too, Via Crucis, the uh, Vatican leaks. Look at the queen, the queen, the model of behavior of the United Kingdom. She too, and then not just her. We, our delightful little prime minister in Canada. Yes, holy Canada too. Everybody is taking advantage of everybody else in this particular case. So what are the big case? Well, WikiLeaks, you heard, that was a big one, the first big one, 2010. Um, implant scandal are, have been more talked about last year, but they started in 2010. Vatican leaks, 2012, <coughs> and it continues. Uh, Edward Snowden, you no need to expand too much on him, except that we're talking 1.7 million internal documents that represent only 15% of the size of Panama Papers. Panama Papers, sorry. Swiss Leaks, 2015, 2015 is eight, eight, uh, 16. Uh, an anonymous leak lead to the Panama Papers, then Paradise Papers, 13 million documents leaked again anonymously to Obermeyer and Obermeyer, these are the two people who started the Panama Papers with the Sudetu Zeitung, and then of course the recent one, the one uh, MDB scandal in Malaysia. <coughs> so what it takes, I think this is an amazing <coughs> story, uh, two people take, take risk. It's very courageous and you'll see why <coughs> later. This is the discussion that happened, or the, the writing, but the ex mail exchange, encrypted mail exchange between the person who revealed uh, to the Sudaito Zeitung, uh, the Panama Papers, hello, this is John Doe, which is the classic name that carries the other one. Uh, my life is in danger, we will only chat over encrypted files, no meeting ever. <coughs> and. Uh, for the motivation of doing it, I understand, I understood enough about their content to realize the scale of the injustice they described. So this was the motivation of actually becoming uh, the uh, whistleblower. Bastian Obermeyer, I'm interested that both of them are called Obermeyer, but one is written with a Y and the other with IE. Bastian Obermeyer, the first thing about collaborative investigative journalism is that you are dealing with not only a national but a transnational issue and you're dealing with an enormous amount of material for which no journalist is equipped to deal by himself or herself. So the idea is over my says it's the, the whole the, the files were way too big and they were also leading to other countries and of course his thought was yes but I mean a lot of these things don't concern Germans but he thought again, he said, well, wait a minute, no, other countries need to know these things too. And that's why the impulse was to start opening it up to other papers. We decided to share the material with the, in, uh, the International Consortium of <coughs> Investigative Journalism, and that's with more than 400 journalists all around the world. A few dates. Of course, collaborative journalism, investigative or not, is, has a long story. Um, 
it was created first, uh, Associated Press was created first because uh, the war between Mexico and the United States was going on and no, they could not, all papers could not cover it, so they began to syndicate the news and the distribution of Associated Press came along. The next one was the creation of Reuters, 10 years later, or in fact less. Then finally in France after the war, uh, l'agence France Presse. And all of that is not just, not really <coughs> investigative journalism, but it is collaborative journalism, we would say. But then Charles Lewis in 89 founds the uh, Center for Public Integrity. Then within the Center for Public Integrity in 97, expands it to International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, which gave them a lot more power to actually start things. For example, the, the implant files were not revealed by some whistleblower. They were actually started by this particular group of researchers. 2003, Global Investigative Journalists Network. 2006, Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project and so on. In 2015, the European Investigative Collaboration Network. So we're in good hands, or at least we should think so. It's interesting, of course, that this creates a reaction. So when WikiLeaks came through and was pouring more and more things and threatening also, oh, oh no, there's no more, <laughs> no more gas. <laughs> we need to, uh, sorry about that. No, but it's interesting that um, if you remember how WikiLeaks developed, uh, at one time, Assange, with, who was not yet in the Ecuador embassy, threatened to release information about the banks. It was one thing to release information about the military, but the whole idea of releasing about the banks. Now, what did he have about the banks? We need to know. But it's interesting how there was a tug of war between uh, the uh, Financing institution, of course, the government. Here we go. Ah, lovely, we got it. So, um, challenges facing the leakers. Technical or corporate, uh, PayPal dropped, uh, dropped the uh, contact with uh, WikiLeaks. Uh, MasterCard, Amazon, uh, what else here? Post Finance, Everyday Net, all of this. Then the legal system, arrest, prosecution, uh, anti-WikiLeaks uh, bill, then the political U.S. Air Force, John, Joe Lieberman, all these people attacked it, tried to stop it, because at the time it felt that you could still stop this sort of thing. Now you can't do that anymore at all. But so, of course, there was defense. Assange and his group actually found ways of turning around the, the, um, objection, the obstructions. Uh, legally, it was, we see how Mueller has a rough time legally proving anything. Uh, in that time was what you could turn around legally. And of course, politically, you had your defenders. And this is the way by which this particular uh, battle happened. But what's really interesting is how the collaborative media really worked. So what you have, after, if this is a description of seven steps of, uh, of process, the secure information comes from John Doe. Step two, media partners of the signal network uh, Editors and journalists leading you as they uh, explore visit uh, viable tips together. The media partners verify the tips, analyze the evidence, and formulate the narrative. This is about the sharing system, right? The journalists report diverse array of stories. A series of in-depth reports are published. Step six, the collaboration effort translate to a reach of over a million, a hundred million audience worldwide. And then the signal network uses the impact of the investigation to rally for accountability and concrete change. So this is all very good news. Um, the challenge is to, the, the big challenge is of course is to sh get the reporters around the world to share the information. Not to mention the fact that there are a lot of things uh, in, the, uh, in this sharing process that are extremely difficult because of very different ways of treating media and very different media to treat those information in. So there was a lot of challenge to that. The International Consortium of Investigative Journalists realized that they, if they published everything all together around the world on one day, it would, much, it would have a far greater impact, which is a technically a, a strategy very strong. The fine print, each organization needs a champion on top. This is very important because even within the editorial room, you need the support of the editor, chief editor, and you need that support very strongly and very, very present. 
establish clearly defined role and seed control, think bit but start small. It always takes longer than you think. What are the essential? Trust building is the first thing. It's extremely difficult to count on 400 journalists around the world to not let the cat out of the bag. So you must be sure <laughs> that you can trust the people you have given the information to. And that itself is one of the biggest challenges. Confi confidentiality is another one. <coughs> Having a very clear objective and success measure. It's expensive. It's very expensive. It's, it's, uh, it sounds wonderful. You're, you're, very, you're a whistleblower. You broke a news which is really very serious and that everybody needs to know. And then it all goes, it doesn't. It requires enormous skills. It requires a lot of money. It's a lot of time of journalists spent on something where they could actually do something else. There are all kinds of things that make an editor think twice about saying, well, am I going on this project or am I not going to do it? Thank goodness technology is around to help and we'll give you some example. So, uh, and of course, the neutral partner. Here's an example of <laughs> typical, typical problem, uh, how to deal one of the major questions is also to protect the people who are giving you the information. In this case, in Ghana, these people are testifying, but they're testifying completely hidden. Um, the needs, the need for journalism, particularly accountability journalism, is to respond to the new international environment. Uh, consider that is transnational. Collaborating with expertise beyond the media. And uh, of course, recognize the value of pan-national collaboration and the protection against national networks or government by sustained transnational. You see, the other thing is government resists, and in, in the case of uh, uh, one MDB, uh, it was the government resists for a fair bit. It took a lot of work to get them to confess. Among the tools, you have um, secrecy for sale inside the global money, uh, offshore money maze, secret of uh, offshore names revealed. You can actually have access to some of these databases, and, uh, and, and it, it helps the journalists to meet. Now many things are, are in place to facilitate the work of the journalists. Collaborative investigation depends on a number of levels of technology. The scale of the data released in the leak like that of Edward Snowden requires technology and uh, the technical expertise to hold and analyze. Encryption and other techniques need to be known, not practiced by all, systematically by all journalists. I suppose now schools of journalism teach you this sort of thing, but at the time it wasn't the case. Um, defensive technology required to prevent external or internal hacking, uh, global cooperation, management partnership, sharing material and working jointly on, uh, in different location. This is a, an interesting uh, set of numbers, 400 billion industry, implant files, 8 million health records, 1,500 public records requests, 26, 36 countries, and 250 journalists. You can see the scale of these things. The interesting thing, of course, is that it was started by the International Consortium of, in, of uh, Investigative <coughs> Journalism. It was not something that was initiated by a whistleblower. So now you can see that different kind of organizations are taking responsibility for exploring matters that are of public interest. And this is an interesting, uh, the using machine learning algorithm is one of the uses, but the other thing is it's using the database of manufacturer and user facility device experience, M-A-U-D-E, contains millions of reports, more than 5.4 million sent to the Food and Drug Administration over the last decade on suspected device associated deaths, serious injuries and malfunction. Most are from the US, but the, F the Food and Drug Administration receives foreign reports as well. Then we have the case of the whistleblower, in particular, we remember Christopher Wiley with his funny hairdo uh, in for the Cambridge Analytica uh, reveal, revelation. In the case of uh, um, 1MDB, the Malaysia Development Berhad or Board, Claire New Newcastle Brown actually mm, was invited to Singapore to come and make declarations. She'd been working years on this problem because she had realized it was really happening, but she had no proof. And so she was invited in Singapore to uh, go and deliver the news to a group of journalists and, and people. But somebody warned her, your invitation is phony. If you land here, you'll be arrested immediately. So she stayed and she did her whistleblowing uh, via video conferencing from her living room in London. Uh, 
Uh, it was involving this man who was the Prime Minister of Malaysia, who, of course, denied everything for a fair bit, but eventually was held responsible. Okay, so far we've got people who got scot free. It doesn't always happen. You all remember last year's uh, murder by a car bomb of Daphne Caruana Felicia in Malta. Uh, again, collective journalism worked in order to support her by continuing her stories, her unfinished stories. But this is the numbers. Dying on the front lines, it's the new front. The, connected, you know, the collective uh, investigative journalism is the new battle front for the news and for the various uh, uh, misdoings in the world. 368 journalists murdered between 2012 and 2017. Uh, this is uh, countries by, by regions. In Iraq, 309. Philippines, 146. Mexico, 120. Mexico is becoming an expert in this area. Uh, Pakistan, 115. Russia, 109. Uh, Algeria, 106. India, 95. And so forth. Um, in the case of, of, of Mexico, one uh, journalist every 26 days is killed for uh, you know, doing his job. So it's very discouraging. You know, this is what Paul Radu says. Investigative journalists have had some great successes like the Panama Papers and done some amazing work, but we're still doing too little. Look at the levels of corruption and organized crime. They are growing every day. The corrupt are so powerful, they're effectively capturing governments and their collaboration across borders is far better than ours. What we're doing is like picking one chili here and another there. So what's, where does that leave us now? How can we think, how can we think and deal with a situation like this? So you, have heard, you probably have heard the word datacracy, you know? the new word that describes the power of data that take over from the power of people. Uh, it's operating in justice, it's operating in medical diagnostics, it's operating in financial decision, it's operating in military decision. So in many of the most important areas of human affairs, algorithms are taking over from people. And so why not for social behavior, since everybody is under surveillance, you are all under surveillance. I am under surveillance, wherever we are. But there are different models. There is two models here. On one side, you have Xi Jinping, and on the other, you have Donald Trump. On the left, you have a man who has to herd, not cats, but one billion and a half citizens. And on the right, you have a man who is just playing around I, me, me, mine. What you have here is the epitome of two entirely opposite cultures. You have the cultures of the individual of which most of us here are part of, and you have the cultures of a community that is of society, a sharing society in some fashion. So what does the Chinese model look like? Well, it looks like what you've heard called social credits. Social credit is analyzing your behavior continuously, evaluating your value continuously. And it would be very nice if that's all they wanted to do. No, they actually give you continuously punishment or rewards for how you behave. Last year, 1,700,000 people were denied access to airplanes and uh, speed trains, not only in some cases, because they had not behaved, they had crossed too many, they had zigzagged across too many, tree, uh, too many streets. No, because they had too many friends who had a very low rate. Who saw a free fall from a Black Mirror? Anybody? You're a, this is a very low cultured group. Uh, no, but you should, <laughs> you should watch Black Mirror. It's very predictive. That particular one is quite extraordinary of this woman who loves being judged by all her friends, except that when it starts becoming lesser and lesser uh, positive, she can get a plane to go to the marriage of her best friend. This is, this is really, and it ends up with a total disaster. The, the film is really worth looking at. There's many other things that Black Mirror is do, are doing, but that particular one is the one which is the instant education of the effect of social credits in China. So what you see on the top is all the valuation that has done on the right side, it's for companies, on the left, it's for individuals. And of course, it's got everything, your uh, 
your medical records, your, your buying records, your, all the information, your, what moves you have done, how many, how many streets you have crossed uh, illegally. Uh, you know, I find that everybody, <laughs> everybody here is, <laughs> we come from Naples, so we cross streets. But uh, here in, uh, in Bilbao, people are at more, much more careful and they take, you know, they wait till the, <laughs> they wait till the red light uh, becomes green. Well, you do that in China, you lose a point and uh, many other things, you lose a point. And on the bottom, you have all the things that you can or cannot have according to what kind of rating you have. You cannot live in this neighborhood. You cannot get this bank loan. You cannot get on that train. So this is being systematic, and it is continuous. It's, you know, we thought that God could see inside our soul and you know, kept track of our sins. So nothing compared to this. Imagine that this is one of the models that will work. Now, why does it work in China? And how do the Chinese people feel about it? Well, that's a good question. A good question that Yasheng Wang, MIT faculty, has actually explained. One reason Chinese attitudes are different is that as recently as the 1980s, the word privacy had negative connotations in China. Isn't that interesting? The very word that was so key to what's happened to our own privacy uh, was something considered bad bad manners. Chinese norms are anchored in 2,000 years of Confucian culture that values the intensity of interpersonal relationships. One way to solidify those relationships is through transparency and full disclosure, like in a monk, a monastery. A circumstance that triggers secrecy is typically an unsavory one. If something is good, why not tell us? Privacy in this context was equated with preserving a dirty secret. To be private was to be antisocial. China's surveillance culture existed long before the rise of big data. Technology has made the repression more precise, but precise repression might be an improvement over indiscriminate repression. And that's the key. That's, that's a very obs important observation. The idea is, within a certain kind of social context, you can do that. Of course, it would not work with us. Why? It's already happening with us, but with lots of room to move. There is like, we, we, we still have the illusion of autonomy, the illusion of freedom, and we will probably maintain it for a while. But surveillance cameras are beginning to populate the cities. But big data know everything about you. I call that the, you know, the uh, digital unconscious. Everything that's known about you that you don't know, and that has much more importance and impact on your life than anything that Freud said. So it's a very interesting thing that we're in a situation that's very comparable to the Chinese, but we have our own background, Morris attitude. We are a civilization based on privacy, based on individuality, based on autonomy, not based on community. So everything that you're talking about is actually recreating community in a context where it's actually not normal. That's, a, that's one of the problems. So my last slide is just this. Uh, a sharing government for Europe. This is a, a student of mine from the Politecnico in Milano, where I, where I still teach, gave me this. It's very naive, but it's also maybe something that we can consider. Everything we open, all the information, all the data, but total accountability from the government. Is it possible? Is it wishful thinking? I really don't know. But one thing for sure is that the more we get digitized, the more we get algorithmized, the more shall we have to develop an algorithmetics, how to behave, how to be, when you're under constant surveillance. So, maybe it'll make investigative journalism not necessary anymore. I suppose that's room for thought. Thank you. <laughs>